Information provided in this podcast should not be considered investment advice. Please see our website pretosec.com slash compliance for a complete disclaimer and more information. Hi everyone and a happy new year to all listeners. First podcast of the year we're going to kick off with uh, an oil episode in uh, two parts. In uh, this first part we're going to talk with Nadia Martin Viggen, which is the oil analyst here at Preto, and then in part two we're going to sit down with uh, Tom Eric Christiansen, who covers the uh, companies and talk more about his thoughts for the year. So Nadia, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. It's good to be back in uh, bright, snowy Oslo. Yeah, in the studio. You haven't been there since we did that uh, trophy podcast uh, at our energy conference back in September. For all listeners, I uh, I urge you to to take a uh, look at that one. It's uh, in uh, in the podcast history. It's a very good with the chief economist of uh, Trafigura at the time. So uh, let's uh, touch a bit up on uh, last year before we go deeper into the details of this year. But last year, going into 22, yes. we already had an energy not a crisis, but a crunch. Yes, we were absolutely in a supply-demand crunch. That had, of course, started with Australia um, banning um, coal exports to China because they blame China for COVID. And then that started this hoarding of coal, which then went to gas, and then eventually started to hit oil as that swing additional uh, demand for oil, for heating, and so forth. And from that demand side, I would say, you know, that is something that for the first half of the year was absolutely the story in 2022. Then we also had the supply side. And by that, of course, I mean the uncertainty that came after Putin took advantage of this supply crunch by invading Ukraine. And, you know, we saw almost overnight that traders and especially European oil companies stopped buying Russian crude, you know, in February, March, because they weren't sure if they would get deliveries, if it would be allowed and so forth. You know, so we had that initial real drop off in oil supply coming to the market. But by the end of the year, you know, Russia was back at above 11 million barrels per day of oil supply. You know? So that supply story did not hold. And this, you know, created a lot of uncertainty and volatility and, of course, opportunity on things. And, you know, when we then look at the supply response from other countries, you know, having seen that initial fall off in Russian supply, we had the U.S., you know, always historically since 2014, you know, the one that's really bringing in much more supply and it was much more delayed. So we did not see that supply response, which just made everyone so much more bullish. We did get some additional production though from OPEC. We got some additional production from US Shale, but not the kinds of numbers um, in the past. So we got, you know, even a 200,000 barrels per day out of Canada. Um, so that, that helped things, but, you know, demand from the summer just completely collapsed in China because of zero COVID. And, and that and is what pushed the price trend. Yeah, and the, and the swing there, because up on the invasion, you obviously had a supply get from Russia, but suddenly that supply found out other routes, India, etc. Mm -hmm. And you had a big shift in, in May when China suddenly introduced a zero COVID policy and was a way with Two million barrels? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in one month, we saw imports drop one and a half million barrels per day, month on month, right? That's a big deal. Um, you know, when you <laughs> consider that by IA numbers, we're, we're circling around 100 million barrels per day of demand. Um, and I think the expectation was that China wouldn't stick with that policy. And then the re-election of Xi was supposed to shift things. But then in the re-election, he was awarding the hardliners on zero COVID. So that delayed things, I think, even more in terms of that uh, Chinese comeback. Um, in my personal view, though, I think also, you know, China is being smart. <laughs> they see 
and saw that this EU import ban was coming December 5th, right? And the market was very worried again about this drop off in Russian supply. So why should China start buying into that strength? You know, they want to wait and of course get the discounts on Russian crude. And you know, in the start of the year, we've heard that they've been buying some barrels at less than $40 a barrel. So that and is very sensible when, you know, November, December, we were trading at, you know, you know, between 80 and 90 plus dollars a barrel. You know, we were actually in 98 at one point in November. You know, that's not the best time to be buying if uh, you can get this incoming discount from Russia on Russian crude. Because that's what we have seen at the beginning of the year, that more Russian crude is going to China. Uh, yeah, I in general, yes. It's actually been India that has been the biggest buyer of Russian crude uh, so far. Russian crude exports are actually up um, in the latest data that we see from December. But actually, Chinese crude buying is really lagging. And this is why you know we're currently at above $83 a barrel. But why aren't we higher? today already you know our outlook continues to be very bullish for this year our forecast is for hundred dollars a barrel but we expect 115 dollars by q2 you know we expect 95 dollars this quarter you know in q1 and and what is that based on it's based on china buying but a few factors have not supported prices at the very start of the year right the first thing is the fact that we have an early chinese new year right so it's coming in december it's not coming in February, which then means when we look at buying November and December, of course, you're not you want to deliver before the new year, but not the week of the new year, right? Because then that's like a week of where you don't want, you know, where things just fall off. So that's the first thing when we look at that number on the imports. And when we look at December versus November, we see 2.7 million barrels per day of less crude. That's even bigger than the month to month drop that we saw in the inflection point in the summer, right? The second point is that um, we've had crude exports, though, continue to fly out of China. Not crude exports, sorry, refined product exports continue to fly out of China. And, you know, those have jumped when we look at where we were in Q3 at around 500,000 barrels per day. They jumped in the fourth quarter to almost 1.75 million barrels per day. What does that mean? It means that China continues to draw from storage in the fourth quarter. Now they have announced zero COVID is done, right? And we see that there are, of course, illnesses, Chinese New Year is coming, lots of people will probably come down with COVID and other flus and things like that after a period of lockdown, right? However, they need to rebuild that storage before they can actually have everything fully up and fully up and running. And this is where we absolutely expect the, the import numbers to start jumping. You know, speaking to physical oil traders, China came into the trading windows yesterday for the first time this year and started buying up West African crude, right? So that is the first indication that they're back and they're coming back. In addition, you know, Australia and China are now discussing banning the coal ban, right? Hmm, very interesting that that is suddenly happening. That's a huge game changer that is now, you know, a year and a half in the making. It shows that even though China has ramped up all coal production, you know, en masse, they still want to import. The third point we're going to see the numbers is on the natural gas numbers. And we're going to see LNG imports starting to get pulled there and away from Europe. And you know, Europe is sitting at almost 85% storage levels in natural gas. So we can do with that being pulled away. So we expect that China's oil demand is going to be very visible already next month. And for the year, we're going to see a jump of 1.5 million barrels per day year on year, which is unprecedented. We've never seen it jump that quickly in the past. And last year... Is but last year was also unprecedented in terms of the, in terms of the negative growth. Yes, we've, we haven't seen that this century. And it was down 600,000 barrels per day. So that is such a massive turnaround in the market. And it doesn't only affect China, it also affects all the neighboring Asian countries. And when we look at activity, right, and part of you know, what has been driving this negative macro sentiment on the world has been the fact that you know, we've seen Chinese exports of products, as in like created things, down. 
right? And part of that is, of course, the inflationary pressures. But what is the cause of that inflation? And it's because of supply chain difficulties that start with China in terms of zero COVID. And that has affected the rest of Asia as well, which has affected the entire supply chain into Europe and into the US, which is, um, you know, driven up inflation and caused all these central banks to keep raising interest rate. You know, we have 85% of central banks having raised interest rates last year. That's enormous. Only two lower them in the whole world. So So that that's the backdrop. That's the yeah. backdrop where obviously China, uh, as always, when we speak about commodities, uh, they are important. But look, let's take a look at some of the scenarios that you have listed up for 23. Yeah, so I divided them into two upside risks and two downside risks. And the first one on the upside is that Russian oil supply falls after EU sanctions. Because in our view, we actually expect Russian production, oil production, to be flat year on year. So as I mentioned, it jumped up to 11 million barrels per day um, at the end of last year. Um, we expect, on average, though, it was 10.8 million barrels per day for last year, and that included you know, the big fall um, that happened after the initial invasion, so really in Q2. But on average for this year, we expect flat oil production, which compared to a lot of analysts, our base case is quite bearish. You know, they expect the oil production will fall. You know, the IEA is still talking about, we'll see what their next report says, but they're still expecting about a million barrels per day loss. And that is something when we think about the sentiment of the market, you know, there is still this risk that when the market realizes that Russian production hasn't actually fallen, there could be a bit of a temporary knee jerk reaction. That is absolutely a buying opportunity um, because that's basically the last bearish thing that that needs to happen, you know, in, in terms of the price or, or can happen. So that's why I think of it as an upside risk, because if we actually do see a steady decline in Russian production you know, over the course of this year, that will just make things tighter. Um, you know, we still have uh, OPEC cuts going on, um, so they can step into that. But then we start to hit their spare capacity numbers, which flows into my upside risk, too. Um, upside risk, too, is that when China comes back, OPEC plus fails to deliver spare capacity production quickly enough to meet that demand need. Um, and this is where, you know, why China is going to start buying ahead of when the overall macro numbers in China suggest that, you know, China is fully up and running. Um, you know, when we think about where we are on the spare capacity numbers, you know, October, early October, first week of October, October 5th, um, we had the OPEC plus agreement <coughs> to cut production by a headline number of 2 million barrels per day, which is effectively 1.1 million barrels per day. Why do we have to have that? In our view, it is because, not because of the demand picture as much as the fact in terms of demand slowing down uh, in the second half of the year, um, that wasn't the full story. That was you know, maybe half the story, maybe even a bit less. The main problem in our view is that OPEC Plus didn't have the spare capacity when they saw that China would come back. Because that was obviously a big political narrative between the US and the Saudi last year. W would they boost production or, you know, and, and how quickly? And, you know, they, they did temporarily boost production, um, but very temporarily, you know. And that cut, though, in our view, you know, we, we had spare capacity dropping so low that, you know, some forecasters still had them at two and a half million barrels per day. In our view, we, we had them probably at around one million barrels per day. But Trafigura, to whom you alluded um, in our previous podcast, you know, they had it at around 600,000 barrels per day spare capacity. Therefore, OPEC plus absolutely needed to cut 1.1 million barrels per day minimum to have enough oil for when China's demand jumps 1.5 million barrels per day. It's very simple mathematics that this was the bare minimum they needed to do. Then we saw that demand had in general slowed down, so they looked even smarter for doing it. But 
Of course, they can cut more if demand is slower coming back from China, and if we don't have additional um, supply coming from uh, other places, they can bring it back up. You know, I would say the last thing on the supply question is that you know we we don't see a lot of spare capacity in OPEC Plus. You know, they're they're at the bare minimum of a happy spot, um, but. Depending on how quickly the demand jumps in China, right? And 1.5 million barrels per day is just China. Our overall forecast for demand growth in oil is 2.1 million barrels per day, right? For the entire world. Um, when we look at the breakdown, though, we have at least 1.8 to 2 million barrels per day of additional demand coming just from the jet market, right? Aviation. When everyone starts flying again, right? So. What we expect, you know, is when summer flying, April, Easter, things like that, then things will really start to jump higher. We're going to have a strong price signal. You know, that's why we have $115 in Q2, which then will spur U.S. shale production. And that is something we cannot forget because last year, yes, it was very slow to come back, much slower than the market had expected. Part of this discussion has been, are the sweet spots gone, so forth. But one of the biggest holdups has been the lack of personnel to actually complete wealth. And you know, speaking with the service operators, you know, now since the start of the year, finally, applications for jobs to work in the oil field service industries in the US is finally way up. So we, coupled with very strong oil prices, we do expect them to come back. Um, but not to be worried, we still <laughs> expect the market to be strong this year. Um, moving on to downside risks, right? Um, our first one is that we get deeper recessionary pressure. I mean, today is a big day that we, you know, we get our... Um, CPI. CPI print, but that was that was also, s I mean, if you look at oil last year, mm -hmm. where you basically started and ended up at, l at the same place, but with an extremely volatile year, then recessionary risk started to take over during the summer. Yeah. And you saw that maybe more on gas, where you saw fertilizer plants in Europe shutting down, etc. You saw gas to a bit gas to oil switching, etc. But going yeah, and in it's kind of ironic because yeah. you know already in June people were wondering if that was going to be the the peak inflationary number, but the number is still very high, and that is I think the, what changed in the summer is people are like, wow, these uh, interest rate increases are going to be sharp, and they're going to be lasting. So I think that has been a big issue. But when we look at open interest, for example, and where managed money is sitting right now in January, right? We're at the net length is at 50% this year, this day in January versus last year. Last year was an all-time low in January. When we look at the last five years, it's been lower and lower each year. And you know, part of what I started off saying, you know, explaining this early Chinese New Year, how bad the imports looked out, uh, looked into China for crude in December. You know, all of this is delaying. You also want to have your first trade of the year correct, right? And the oil price has come down mm. um, in that week, in the last week, right? And so this is making the bulls hesitate a little bit. But I just think that, you know, already China's coming into the market yesterday. That's going to start to shift things. Um, but having said that, you know, there is a risk that in the second half of the year, the bite of the recessionary pressure, um, you know, hits oil m much more strongly. And that's where we go from seeing, you know, strong draws in the third and fourth quarter to actually seeing built coming forward. Um, you know, that is uh, also in a case that we, we have it affecting the entire supply chain, you know, that even though China is coming back, that you, you don't have the U.S. capable of taking on what uh, China is producing. And even though we may have peaked in terms of U.S. dollar strength, 
our expectation isn't that the U.S. dollar is suddenly going to collapse. So the U.S. will still have purchasing power. So I think versus some of the street, I think uh, that recessionary pressure concerns is a bit overdone. Um, the second main risk we see, and this is, of course, the lever of the Biden administration, is that they resume SPR releases um, in mass. I mean, we still had an SPR release last week. So they haven't even fully stopped yet. And what was interesting is we had this brief window last year where we actually were kind of hitting the buying price for the US SPR. You know, $72 WTI was supposed to be when the Biden administration would start buying, but they were still releasing. Because then this is where it's a little bit ridiculous for the US to behave like a trader. Uh, because they just, the government isn't fast enough to take opportunity, you know, they should be buying their own barrels almost. Um, and that is, I think, makes it a little bit problematic when they think about how they're going to be treating this. If we actually were to hit these low 70s and stay there for a few weeks, they absolutely need to start buying because the moral risk in terms of that communication with oil producers, when they have promised, we're gonna buy your oil if we're at $72 a barrel, we will be buying from you when the shale producers were saying we're not going to do it because we don't want to destroy our own market because that was a back and forth last year obviously with biden and versus the oil companies and i guess everybody who watched the news uh noticed that uh, he told them to drill more they told him that it's been one year with the with the it's been one year with the green numbers we need to see stability etc and he basically promised them a put on the oil Absolutely. price to make sure that uh, that uh, they could invest with some visibility into the future. And you know, it was already controversial because the week before going into the OPEC meeting, he had offered the OPEC producers $80 a barrel. You know? So it's uh, very tricky if you're promising, you know, that you're going to be buying and you're continuing to release oil in, into the market. And I mean, I know for Europeans, maybe the, the U.S. election seems far away, but it's not that far away. It's, you know, a year and a half away effectively. And when we look at our price outlook for this year, it's $100 for this year. Yes, some softness coming in the fourth quarter because of that jump in U.S. shale. Um, but when we look towards 2024, because of that general uninvestment that we've seen, you know, we need to invest at least $500 um, billion dollars every year in oil and gas EMP. And when we look for the next 10 years, we're short. We're in the 400s. Last year was probably just under 450. Yeah. So that is where we have this, you know, we're still in this cyclical upcycle. And 2024, $100 oil in the summer is very problematic for Biden in that election. So he needs to absolutely support things to have U.S. shale producing um, and therefore, you know, needs to be ready to activate any potential puts. And that is also you're starting the uh, the SPR balances from uh, from a lower place than where you are today. But uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they can keep releasing, and there will be some small releases that Congress has already agreed to do this year. So it's not problematic yet. But if we have the Chinese growth engine on full throttle, we cannot just deplete the US SPR endlessly and just hand over everything to China. And, and this is about striking that balance. So you know, we, we see that the Biden administration is pulling back on some of like the environmental um, concerns that were going to be, um, you know, uh, had to be implemented in US oil extraction. So he is realizing that, you know, why is he doing that? It's an additional cost for producers, right? And so they need to get that money in the bank to pay their shareholders, this continues to be the theme, right? We're still seeing relative underinvestment versus where we should be. We've seen some coming back and we're seeing the oil services industry ramp up as, you know, oil majors announce things. Exploration is starting to come back, but it's not nearly at the levels. You know, we, last year's FIDs 
we're at a low. So we're, we're not anywhere near where we need to, do, need to be. And this is what that communication uh, really needs to improve. And you know, also in terms of the general macro picture, you know, yes, we expect Europe to show uh, recession in terms of oil demand. We expect US oil demand to be flat this year but we expect next year for things to start to come back. We're not expecting a, a prolonged recession lasting years, even in that situation. We expect it to be relatively short in um, the bear scenario and in our base case, also relatively short. So in 2024, we do see demand growth coming back um, everywhere else. I think you always it's always easy to have the most recent history in the in your forehead. I mean you had a upcycle in oil, then you had a downturn. You thought that the downturn will, would be very swift. It was well, not. it was, it was in very, COVID. Yeah, yeah, that yeah in one COVID, was very but, swift. but from fourteen. Yes. And now you're seeing the opposite. But but I would say in twenty fourteen, you know, but this is we, we should be building up towards a twenty fourteen. But we had three years of massive investment coming in from the price signals, right? We had $100 oil for three years in a row. We're going to have that now in our view, yep. but we're not seeing nearly that. We're, we're already a year plus behind on where we should be on that investment side to create that. Um, so this is, you know, of course it goes up and then it, it goes down, but we're not even near the up yet to create that next down. No, that, that's what I meant. That's what <laughs> yeah. I meant. That's, that's, uh, and we talked about that in the podcast with our, our oil service analyst pre-Christmas that, yes, you're seeing investment, but yeah. mostly from the NOCs and the IOCs and not at levels which you saw in the past, especially not when looking at the cash flows uh, of exactly. the, of and, and the this big is majors. And this is where, you know, that focus on demand is so important. When you look OPEC, they expect demand to rise 2.3 million barrels per day this year. We expect 2.1. But if we have everything come back, it's minimum three or four million barrels per day year on year growth in demand. And that is massive, massive. We believe some of that extra is coming in 2024, not all hitting this year. But let's focus on first the upside. We cannot miss this upside hill. Right now, it's such a buying opportunity where we are at $83 a barrel. Focus on that. And then when we're starting to get near the top, we can see when that is, how that is, and what are the other factors. But the key message is now it's all up. That's very good. I think we have spent uh, a bit over 25 minutes, so we can leave it with there. Obviously, Pareto has uh, its annual ENP conference in London next Wednesday on the 18th. You're going to be there, uh, Nadia. So that's a very interesting conference with a lot of interesting ENP uh, companies. And we're going to talk with uh, Tom Eric in part two of uh, this episode to hear more about his thoughts for 2023. Nadia, great to see you. I hope we can do an episode not uh, not too long from now. And uh, we'll see where... The only thing I know is that we will probably see some volatility. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is clear in the commodity market. Yeah, but, but we have it opportunity. Volatility is opportunity. Exactly. And, you know, I'll just say Happy New Year and Happy Upcoming uh, Chinese New Year when things will really start to fly. Thank you very much. See you in the next episode with Tom Eric. The information provided in this podcast should not be considered professional advice and is not intended to constitute investment advice. Investing and trading in all types of securities involve considerable risk at all times and past performance is not necessarily a guarantee of future performance. Pareto Securities does not accept any form of liability, neither legally nor financially, for any direct or indirect loss or expenses that may arise from the use of information provided in this podcast. Please see our website paretosec.com compliance for more information and full disclaimer. <laughs>